Hi everybody, I'm Jack, the Rambling Rack and Turn. I hope you're doing well. Uh, we are in week two of Here Lies Herodotus, books two and three, and I hope you're enjoying these. Uh, we definitely get natural history, geography, weird history, like well, the stuff Herodotus is interested in, um, and some actual history. Of course, these, these are ostensibly the histories of the Greco-Persian Wars, and you'd be forgiven for being utterly baffled by that statement from book one, uh, like the very first sentence in book one because we spend all of book two in Egypt, and then book three does pick up sort of, you know, the the, the uh, succession of Persian kings after Cyrus, but there's not much dealing with Greece in here at all, and that's okay, because Herodotus is fascinated by Egypt. Even if, um, he, you know, he's fascinated by Egypt, he claims to have gone up the Nile, and by that, like, south down the Nile, uh, to Elephantine, to the first cataphract, but he appears to have never actually seen a hippopotamus on his journeys through Egypt, which is just interesting. Um, but let's jump in. So we, we, he very quickly says, Cambyses succeeds Cyrus. Uh, Cambyses is the son of Cyrus, is king of Persia, and he proceeds to invade Egypt. So let's just talk about Egypt for 75 pages. And that's what we do. Um, he talks about, and there, there is this sense of Egypt is important because it's believed to be sort of like the oldest civilization. You know, even in 5th century uh, BC, there's this recognition that Egypt has, has a, an antiquity that other, other nations, other civilizations, other cities, even Babylon, don't quite have. And that's a, that's a theme that would run not just from Herodotus, but even into the next century, 150 years later. Uh, Alexander and then his various generals s sort of had this recognition of there was something different and unique and, and like almost mystically ancient about Egypt. So, um, so Herodotus is duly fascinated by it as so many people are just, you know, growing up now on earth in the 21st century. Uh, and so we, we have a little detail about like, oh, is Egypt actually the most ancient civilization or is it the Phrygians? And uh, which is where King Midas, uh, the ledger and uh, gold touch, uh, had ruled. And Herodotus describes this fascinating experiment involving depriving children of human contact to see uh, which word they, uh, they'll, they'll utter first. Is it from an Egyptian language or a Phrygian language? <laughs> it's just Herodotus, of course, goes like the whole thing was pointless and ridiculous. There was no purpose to it. Um, he also has uh, some some questions around what you know what causes the Nile flood to flood so regularly, and this is where we start to see sort of this like salty Herodotus, where he is willing to question authority, and he's even willing to question Homer, and he'll he'll um, he'll be cagey about questioning Homer a little bit later on when he's describing Egypt, where he won't he'll say, well, I think Homer knew the truth, but he recognized it wouldn't have been as great a story for an epic. So he went with, you know, a made up story, but I think Homer knew the truth. But in other places, he just kind of questions the authority of Homer, which is, is important. You know, it places Herodotus and his, his inquiries in this stream of, of human thought that includes later on in the fifth century and the start of the fourth century, um, Socrates and Plato and being willing to question authority. It includes, you know, like running down that stream of, of another 2000 years, the, the ethos of the Protestant Reformation or uh, thinkers like uh, Francis Bacon or Descartes or later on the Enlightenment, all being willing to question received authority. And Herodotus is putting himself in there in a certain sense. Um, sometimes he's willing to accept authority. Other times he just says, I don't believe this. Although it's interesting what he does believe. Uh, so we have a whole question around what caused the Nile to flood so regularly? Is it that wind <laughs> blows south? And just builds up the water. And just can't be that because other other rivers face that, and they don't have nearly as much like you know water volume to, <laughs> to push against that wind. So that can't be it. Is it that the it, the Nile empties? You know, is just emptying and siphoning off from an ocean, and that's where Homer gets brought in. The first one was a theory from Thales. So he uh, Herodotus is not just questioning the great you know epic poet Homer, but he's also questioning one of the earliest philosophers who's believed to have predicted an eclipse. So he's kind of putting himself out there to, to question these. Uh, he, he derides the idea that it could be melted snow um, because it's so much hotter uh, the farther south you go into equatorial Africa. And so uh, it is actually due to monsoon rain. 
Prod just has this idea that the sun like somehow pulls the water around. Um, we get a mention of pygmies, which is interesting. And then we, uh, we do get this bit about the hippopotamus that almost needs to be read because he just misses the mark here. He talks about a crocodile and he, he nails the sandpiper and the mutualism between a sandpiper and a crocodile. Uh, but, but he goes on to the hippopotamus. It says four legs, cloven hoof like an ox, a snub nose, a horse's mane and tail. Conspicuous tusks, a voice like a horse's neigh, and is about the size of a very large ox. Its hide is so thick and tough that when dried it can be made into spear shafts. What the heck is this horse's mane on a hippopotamus? Suggests that Herodotus never actually saw one. River horse would be the etymology of hippopotamus uh, to Greek. We get a description of mummification. We got a description of the phoenix. And Herodotus <laughs> describes the phoenix, which is just glorious. Uh, he goes on to say, it says, there is a story about the phoenix which I do not find credible. I always love it when, when Herodotus says, I'm not going to mention this, like it's too gross, or I'm not going to mention this because it's just too ridiculous, or I, I don't find it credible. Those times are always fun. Uh, we get some detail around mummification, though, and uh, Herodotus is, is careful to not condemn, like, the customs of different cultures, and to sort of, he quotes the, um, the, uh, Greek poet Pindar, who would write Olympian odes on commission, of course, uh, to very wealthy individuals about, you know, custom is the king rule. Like everybody appreciates his or her rules of his or her own land. Um, and we also get this interesting bit about mosquito nets, which I always, I'm always delighted by. Uh, we have then a description of like, let's go into these historical pharaohs. And so we're going to, you know, jump in with King Menace. And then we have this really interesting, so there's one female pharaoh, uh, Natokris, is probably a portmanteau of two uh, pharaohs, like historically, like probably never existed. There doesn't, excuse me, seem to be historical evidence for this Natokris uh, that uh, Herodotus uh, mentions. However, he tells this fabulous story about how she like contrives a way to drown all of these Egyptian nobles who uh, murdered her brother. It's, absolutely fantastic story. We then get about 10 pages about this Sesostris, who's probably, again, a couple of people combined together, um, but some of that being Ramses II, and just some really, like, gory stories as well. Uh, Herodotus, oh, and he includes a, a fun little slide at Darius. He, he periodically, he did this earlier in book one about Darius being, like, greedy and, like, digging out for a uh, um, in Babylon, digging out the wall for, for uh, um, a, uh, where there was a, um, a grave that supposedly had treasure and finding nothing there. Gets another slide at Darius about Darius, like, couldn't conquer the Scythians. So he just drops these in periodically. <laughs> um, but we also get Herodotus' version of the real story of the Trojan War, where Paris and Helen spent the entire war uh, in Egypt. They had been uh, sailed off course into Egypt, and that the, the Trojans didn't actually have them. And, you know, the Greeks were pretty unkind for sacking Troy when the Trojans were telling the truth. And that's where he mentions, I think Homer knew this, but he knew it didn't make a great story. But here's the real story. <laughs> like, what, what gall? Um, he then drops in this business about, here's who made the pyramids, and here's how they built them, and here's how tall they are. Some of his dimensions are quite accurate. Uh, the heights seem to be off by a bit. Um, that may have been due to various various factors, but the base uh, measurements seem to be fairly accurate. Uh, however, those, the pyramids were not built when Herodotus has them. They would have been. They should have been put back when he, between Menes and uh, Natokris, the, the ahistorical Natokris. Um, we have a really interesting story about a clever thief, and this is another one of those like great Herodotus stories where you have uh, what could almost be something out of the Tales of the Thousand and One Nights, like these, just these really brilliant little folk tales, sometimes with a moral, sometimes without, about two brothers who go and they're stealing from the treasury, and then one of them is trapped, and so, you know, he's beheaded so that the brother beheads him so that they won't be found out, and then the mother wants the, you know, the, the body, and so he contrives a way to, uh, uh, <coughs> sorry, um, get the guards drunk and steal the body, and then the king's daughter is going to, you know, uh, 
bed every man to find out what is the wickedest or cruelest thing you've done. And he, he confesses, but he also has this fake, you know, corked arm to pull. It's just incredible and weird, <laughs> just weird history. Um, we get, we get the story about the mice who eat the bowstrings of Sennacherib's army when it comes down from Assyria. And then of course we get Amasis who, uh, quite, you know, demonstrating his art of rhetoric and persuasion when, you know, told the king's demand and he's become essentially a rebel warlord, proceeds to break wind and say, take that back to the king. So, so there's Egypt for you. <laughs> what an interesting land of ancient wonders and scurrilous little tales. And from there, uh, Herodotus picks up from Amasis to be to say, okay, this is the guy who basically started the war with Cambyses. Remember, we're still talking about the Greco-Persian War, so let's pick up Cambyses. And so Cambyses is the son of Cyrus. He invades Egypt on this pretext of, uh, you know, let me marry your daughter. If you say yes, well, I become your heir. If you say no, well, now you're disgracing me, so I'm going to invade. Um, another daughter is sent, so now he's angry. Uh, Amasis is no longer the pharaoh of Egypt. It is now Semenitus. And here's, again, a place where we get both the sort of the cycle of fortune, both with Cambyses and Semenitus, but we also get this really, uh, again, just a beautiful, like, one-page episode where very, like, uh, the daughter of the pharaoh is let out, you know, and dressed as a servant and humiliated with the daughters of other nobles. His son is let out with other noble sons who are, you know, basically like Assyrian, they look like Persian or Assyrian slaves and they're going to be executed. And so far the king has just, you know, been very stoic. But when he sees a, a friend of his who is just like a beggar now being, you know, along with the group, he suddenly breaks down weeping and he says, you know, the other tragedies were so great but to think that that was once my friend and now he's a beggar, I can't, you know, that's, that's something I couldn't, uh, uh, hold back my tears from. And Croesus pops up. What the heck is this guy still doing around? He's advising people now. He, he continues, he, he, he gives himself bad advice. He gives Cyrus bad advice. Cyrus dies. He gives Cambyses great advice. Um, and so Semenitus is, uh, Mercy is shown to him. Of course, he later, re, you know, tries a new rebellion and is murdered. Uh, Cambyses then starts to, you know, experience his hubris. He's going to overreach. So just as Cyrus overreached in the northeast, Cambyses is going to overreach in the southwest. So he decides he's going to go to war with all of Africa. He's going to send an army into, you know, the southern part of Egypt. He's going to send an army out from the western part of Egypt. And he's going to send his fleet across the Mediterranean to go sack Carthage. Of course, it's the Phoenicians who are, you know, the leaders of his fleet. And they say, we're not going to go, you know, murder our cousins. So that's a bit of an embarrassment. But we get this interesting tale. We, we, we first, you know, in book two, we had a mention of uh, pygmies in Africa. Now we get this mention of these really, really tall Africans who sort of taunt Cambyses and the Persians and say, look, like, try to string this bow and pull this, this bow string. Like, what do you all eat? You know, and they, they just kind of, how old do you live to be? Well, we live to be 120. You, you have this sense of like, how much do you bench press? Oh, oh, 165, I can do 185. Like, there's, there's just this constant, like, you tell me first. Um... And so Cambyses leads an army down there without any provisions, well, without enough provisions, and so they starve and turn to cannibalism, and it's quite awful, and they re retreat back. And then we get this one paragraph mention of what uh, has, has been an anecdote that fascinates historians. Uh, it's mentioned in various works of literature. Um, I, in the past 20 years, I know, I've, I saw it like, you know, in the remainder section of Barnes & Noble or Borders when that was around. Um, a book, a nonfiction book about the lost army of Cambyses. And so that comes from this one paragraph mentioned in Herodotus where the army he had sent uh, west from Egypt is out there in the desert and midday while they're eating lunch, a huge sandstorm comes up and buries the entire army and it's lost, never heard from again. It's a fascinating story. 
who knows if it really happened. Um, <coughs> we then get the madness of Kim Bice. So he gets a dream about his brother. He has his brother murdered. His brother had been a regent in Babylon, which was a nice, like, you know, second place prize. Older brother gets to be king of Persia. Younger brother gets to rule Babylon and sort of have some extra freedom. Um, we, uh, he, he, so he has his brother murdered. He murders his sister, who is also his wife, in, in fairly brutal fashion. Um, Herodotus has places where he says, I don't want to tell you the details of because it's just too gross. But then he tells us this business. Um, we have, uh, we get our introduction to Polycrates of Samos, who's now, this is, you know, a, a Greek island. And this is where Greco-Persian conflict is going to start to conflate a little bit more. Like, we're going to, by the end of book three, we're going to wrap around to that. And Polycrates, of course, is going to also follow that cycle of, like, rise and downfall, just as Cambyses and uh, Semenitus, you know, uh, ex demonstrate as well. So Polycrates seems to be very powerful. He hears a story about, like, hey, you know, find whatever you love most and w would never be able to lose. Get rid of it. That way you don't have to worry about losing it. So he throws his ring. It's caught by a fish, this great fish that's brought to him. When it's open, he sees the ring. He goes, oh, no. Like, I, a man can't run away from his destiny. Um, the, <laughs> there's also a mention that he, he seeks an alliance with the Spartans. Uh, or no, those who are trying to take Samos from Polycrates seek an alliance with the Spartans. The Spartans <laughs> rudely say, your story bored me. I, I got lost at the beginning. I can't remember the end. I need you to come back another day and, and try to tell me why we should have an alliance. <laughs> So that's that's one of our early introductions to Sparta, is that um, <laughs> they can be sarcastic, and uh, we they you know go and it's interesting. The Spartans, of course, have this reputation of like great military prowess and great bravery and courage, and what we see is our first real like military interaction that we see from the Spartans is that they lose the battle in Samos, and they. Only two of them are brave and break in. The rest of them kind of hold, hold back and they ultimately lose. So that, that's an interesting note that Herodotus puts in there. Um, we jump back to Cambyses in Egypt where he is just, you know, almost in, you know, reading about Cambyses and the madness of Cambyses always reminds me of the way that some of the Roman emperors are described where it's just like a true tyrant who's just all over the place and, and lashing out everywhere and very dangerous. And so he goes to, uh, a new rebellion has started. There's this false Smyrtus who has the same name as Cambyses' younger brother, his half-brother, um, who maybe looks a little bit like Cambyses' brother. And so that, that man is now proclaiming himself king and, and ruling, you know, and as there's a, new, a rebellion. So Cambyses has to stop the rebellion. And when he goes to get on his horse, he, like, his sword comes uncovered and stabs him in the thigh and he wastes away over three weeks and ultimately dies um and so we have his you know rise and fall he he overreached he lost multiple armies in egypt he basically went insane and just started killing everybody and ultimately like you know uh has an accident that in which he dies an accident uh because it's quite possible that Cambyses historically was just assassinated. Um, and now we get this interesting part where Herodotus firmly takes the Persian line. For a guy who slights Darius multiple times throughout this book, he also swallows the line Darius shares, the story Darius shares of, hey, um, the, you know, there was this guy claiming to be the king, claiming to be the son of Cyrus who was not. And we had to go end this. We had to we had to put this you know this this liar this deceiver, uh, you know out. We had to take this guy out. Well, it's you know that we get this story about a, a, this false Smyrtus and that there's this conspiracy of seven Persian nobles, Darius among them, that they go in, they break in, they ultimately murder him, and that six of them go out to see whose horse neighs first. We get two great details from Herodotus around why it is that uh, Darius's horse is the one that neighs. Um, both deal with uh, the horse, you know, lusting after a mare. Um, take your pick from among those two stories. 
but it is very possible that Darius, you know, and some of these Persian nobles might have murdered Cambyses and then gone up and murdered, you know, his brother Smyrtus and then created this story that this was a false king. Um, <clears throat> that was certainly the line they pushed out was that it was a false king. The line Herodotus gives us is that it's a false king. It's hard to tell what the heck actually happened. Um, uh, we get a really interesting list where Herodotus gives us these 20 regions, uh, you know, these 20 div uh, satrapies of uh, divisions of Persia that are going to give tribute. And that seems to be historically relatively accurate. Where Herodotus gets this information from, it's interesting. We know he didn't speak Persian because of a joke he makes earlier in book one about how their names all end in S, which is not true in the Persian language. So he doesn't speak Persian, but somehow he has fairly accurate details of of sort of the Persian division of government. Um, he also tells us some interesting stuff about the world and the edges of the world being kind of a weird place that in, you know, if you go far enough east in Asia, you find a place where these large ants that are between the size of a fox and a dog dig up gold and they can run really, really fast. So you have to take spare camels to like leave behind when you're fleeing these large ants stealing their gold they dug up. <laughs> What a great, that is apparently credible and more credible than the Phoenix. Uh, Herodotus, also less credible than the gold digging ants are these tin islands somewhere north of Europe. Um, and and the, the idea that there might be a sea out there north of Europe, uh, those tin islands being of course Britain and specifically Cornwall where there were tin mines. And Herodotus doesn't give credence to those. Uh, finally, we jump back to Samos, where Polycrates is, in fact, has his, you know, rise and fall, downfall. Uh, he's horribly murdered and, you know, exposed on a cross. And it all comes down because Darius, you know, agrees to, like, go essentially finance the battle for this island. Uh, because a guy gave him a cloak once when he, you know, before he was wealthy. Uh, we get a... Um, we get another mention of Sparta, and then we have the Siege of Babylon. Now, historically, there seem to have been two sieges. Uh, we have this crazy story about one of Darius's um, earlier, like, you know, Magnificent Seven, Seven Samurai uh, Confederates for the assassination, disfiguring himself and going in and uh, feigning betrayal and winning token victories over the Persians and then ultimately betraying uh, the city of Babylon to the Persians. And there's just a mass, you know, uh, horrific, like, war crime slaughter. Um, no, undoubtedly, we know there were sieges of Babylon. We know Darius went there, that this all occurred. Um, did it all happen that way? You know, who knows? That's why we call it, we're calling it Here Lies Herodotus. But, uh, books four and five next week, Darius goes to war with the Scythians. And then book five, we start to actually get some, you know, traction with those Greco-Persian wars. So, uh, again, let me know what you're thinking. I hope you're enjoying this, and uh, I hope this is a great week for you. Thanks. Bye.